gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Matt Meehan. Forgive me, I'm going to talk about something, the tradition of which mostly includes a lot of people who complained of having gone through the liberal arts and having teachers who beat them with sticks ad baculum. So in one sense, trying to jazz up the liberal arts and make it attractive and exciting is a difficult task because the tradition is full of people who complain about having gone through the liberal arts. Um, but that's just the ones who I don't think learned it as well as the others uh, who uh, are uh, some of the most uh, successful and happy, well-adjusted people in the world. Uh, the liberal arts uh, is something I care passionately about and the school cares passionately about. Um, and a couple other things about this talk tonight, I'm coming at it very specifically from the Catholic perspective. The Heights is an independent school um, with a Catholic spirituality, but I sort of trust anyone who's not Catholic it knows enough to be able to do the sort of mutantis mutandi transfer of uh, thinking through, okay, how does this work for my faith, or even no faith at all, because the liberal arts um, is a long tradition um, that goes all the way back to pagan Greece. So, to begin, uh, there's an old story, Gilbert Hyatt uh, tells it in uh, The Art of Teaching, about an Oxford Don from Oxford University, and he gave this gorgeous talk, you know, for an hour long, holding forth on Homer's Iliad, all about Zeus and his plan for the Greek heroes and Agamemnon and how he had you know, messed things up and was a sort of venal uh, little uh, ruler. And then how Zeus corrected the Greek heroes through the you know, machinations of the, uh, the Trojan War. And afterwards, a student came up to the professor and said, oh, professor, I don't normally do this, but this was such an amazing talk. I, could I get your lecture notes? I really want your lecture notes. You know, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't normally do that sort of thing, and, you know, et cetera, and sort of demurred. Uh, and, and, but the, the student was extremely insistent, uh, and then eventually said, oh, very well, my dear, and he produced an envelope and handed it uh, to the student. Uh, the student opened it, it was empty, but on the back were three little bullet points, and all it said was, Zeus, Agamemnon, Zeus. <laughs> like, that's it, <laughs> right? So, the, you know, the, <laughs> The, the point being, right, uh, that this lecture will not be an hour. Uh, it'll be much shorter than that, I hope. Uh, but if I had to sum up the bullet points on this talk, it would be Jesus, the arts of liberty, uh, and why I call them that, uh, we'll get into, uh, Jesus. Uh, so I'm going to start with Jesus, I'm going to go to the liberal arts, and I'm hopefully going to end with Jesus. Um, and why do that, right? He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the word of God. Jesus Christ uh, is worth beginning uh, anything, uh, and certainly worth beginning the liberal arts. One reason to begin with Jesus, humility. Uh, we need to remember that the liberal arts do not save souls. It's not what they do. That's what Christ does. Uh, and consider St. Isidore the farmer. He's a simple, illiterate serf from the t uh, 12th century, Spain. He couldn't read. He took up a job very early in life, and he tilled a field with a hoe, and it was a tough row to hoe. And he married. He married another <sighs> woman who became a saint. He prayed. He had visions. He performed miracles for the poor and produced food and brought many people to Christ and died childless, or he had one child who died uh, when he was little, uh, and then uh, became one of the five great saints of Spain that were canonized um, from the, uh, the medieval and early modern period. Uh, it's worth just remembering uh, that's all without a liberal arts education. Uh, Jesus works miracles in the hearts of the humble. Or consider St. Therese of Lisieux. Right? It's Teresa of uh, Avila's feast today, but we can talk about another St. Teresa. St. Therese of the child Jesus, uh, the little flower, sort of the, the, the saint of humility, if you will. She's been proclaimed a doctor of the church uh, and she was a terrible speller. Uh, she never really was very good in school. Uh, and she had very little of a liberal arts education. Uh, but part of her teaching as the doctor of the church, and by the way, doctor is Latin for teacher, right? Don't forget, uh, includes the following. This is what she said. 
Jesus does not need books or learned doctors to instruct souls. He who is the doctor of doctors teaches without any need of words. And don't forget the great teacher, philosopher, and theologian, Pope St. John Paul II, made her a doctor of the church for her little way, which is not some complex way requiring the laborious study of old books and the arts of liberty. St. Teresa called her little way the shortcut. Right? Not the long road, but a shortcut. So this uh, doctor of the church says we don't need learned doctors. Um, another shortcut you may have heard of is the story about St. Joseph's workshop in Nazareth. Uh, as a carpenter, St. Joseph was making a bed. He had two beams. One wound up being shorter than the other by accident. He realized he wouldn't be able to get his uh, bed made for the customer on time, so he, uh, you know, he started to despair. And Jesus said, don't worry, Dad. Put, laid the two blocks together and pulled one out, miraculously making it as long as the other one. Uh, and St. Joseph said, oh, how fortunate am I that God has given me this child. Right, here's a shortcut made into a long cut by a miraculous shortcut. Right? <laughs> St. Jose Maria Escrivá, the patron of our school and the founder of Opus Dei, gives a good shortcut to understanding that story about Jesus and St. Joseph. Here's what he says. Joseph would give God no such thanks. He would never work in this way. He was not one for easy solutions and little miracles, but a man of perseverance and effort and, when needed, ingenuity. The Christian knows that God works miracles, that he did them centuries ago, that he does them now, and that he still works them because the Lord's hand is not shortened, unlike that little beam. But miracles are a sign of the saving power of God, St. Jose Maria continues, not a cure for incompetence, nor an easy way to dodge effort. The miracle which God asks of you is to persevere in your Christian and divine vocation, sanctifying each day's work, the miracle of turning the prose of each day into heroic verse by the love which you put into your ordinary work. God waits for you there. He expects you to be a responsible person with the zeal of an apostle and the competence of a good worker. St. Jose Maria offers a shorter version of the same lesson right after. In order to do things properly, we must know how to do them. And he says, I cannot see the integrity of a person who does not strive to attain professional skills and to carry out properly the task entrusted to his care. Perhaps we're a little confused at this point, what's going on, uh, quoting apocryphal gospels. Uh, let's let Jesus speak uh, and hopefully clear this up. Behold. I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and simple as doves. Matthew 10, 16. If we are too simple, we can be taken in by an apocryphal gospel story like the one I just told. If we are not shrewd and wise, like the serpent, we can end up drawing the wrong conclusions about Jesus, about his word, about his church, and about what he as uh, about we as Christians ought to do in our lives. That is, we must be simple, innocent, and holy. But as much as we are able, we must be prudent about the world as well. Lest we, little sheep, become too easily food for those wolves. An apocryphal gospel or a false Christ, see Newsweek, People Magazine, New York Times, The Atlantic Monthly, there's a thousand false Christs out there. Uh, and also, Jesus does not give us shortcuts ordinarily. Uh, but as our wives know well, gentlemen, that if you don't study the map carefully, your shortcut is anything but a shortcut. Behold, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and as simple as doves. These words of Christ were taken up as a guiding light in the last rebirth of the arts of liberty and humanitas, or what it is to be a human. Be ye wise, the Latin here is prudentes, right, prudent. Be you prudent as serpents and simple as doves. It was the unofficial mantra of Christian humanists and faithful reform in Catholic education during the time of Thomas More and Desiderius Erasmus and Boudet and Vives and a host of other uh, uh, minor role characters that are all in their own right, great minds. Uh, in fact, on many of their publications, the Utopia especially, 
but on many of them, uh, the education of a Christian prince by Desiderius Erasmus. About education and training the liberal arts, they put a little logo of sorts, which I hope, uh, does everyone have a copy of that here? Um, Mr. Moss is going to hand them out now. Uh, they called it the Christian humanist caduceus, uh, and that's what I'd like to take a look at with you now. Um, this is sort of blown up, so I could show you here. It looks like the, the medical uh, caduceus that's on ambulances, doctors' offices and apothecaries. Uh, it's two snakes wrapped around some kind of staff uh, with a dove. The snakes are crowned. Uh, this caduceus, as it's called, uh, you've seen it many times. It is a kind of image of that, that line from Matthew 10:16. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. The, the serpents are double, uh, not one and simple like the dove. The dove, the clear image of the Holy Spirit, has the artful protection of not one but two snakes, both crowned as kings of this world. Not just one snake, you need two. Uh, the serpents, the worldly knowledge of human affairs, of poetry and prudence, logic and language, philosophy and law, and the relation of all these to the material world. All these are brought through a friendship of those two left hands at the bottom. And I love the little detail. This was designed actually by Hans Holbein, who you guys may have seen some of his paintings of Thomas More and other, other things, the ambassadors. But it's two left hands holding the stick, ostensibly, I think, because the other two would be shaking hand, right hands. But it's two people there supporting that. So it's, a, it's an act of friendship. Uh, they're preserving uh, this perfect, peaceful simplicity of the holiness of the grace of the Spirit, that little dove. Reason, all man's knowledge, alive and well, natural and true in itself, just like those snakes, protecting faith, wise as serpents and simple as the dove. Fides et ratio, faith and reason, in one little woodcut or shortcut. The languages bordering the woodcut are on the left, a Latin pagan poem from Marshall, and I've given you the translations down below. Uh, so you can look at those uh, at your leisure. That is more or less agrees with Matthew 10, 16. Uh, and on the right is Hebrew from Psalm 125. Uh, and on the bottom and top is the Greek New Testament version of that Matthew 10, 16. Be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. Greco, Roman, Judeo, Christian. These Renaissance proponents of the liberal arts wanted to give good lovers of Jesus uh, an idea or an image that would help them take seriously Christ's words and acquire the worldly prudence as much as possible on offer from the great Greek and Roman philosophers, humans, historians, poets, orators, statesmen, logicians, grammarians, schoolmasters with their clubs, hitting kids, telling them to work. Uh, and they wanted them to come to the aid of the faith and wisely protect the Holy Spirit in the heart of each of us. When Christ says, be ye wise as serpents, he's using the imagery of the Bible that is most associated with this fallen world, right? the serpent in the garden. Right? And given that he knew his words would soon be preached to the pagan world, our Lord is also using the Greco-Roman tradition's account of the serpent as a symbol of healing. The temple of Asclepius, you would go and lay down there at night, and the snakes, so goes the, the teachings of the temple, would come and lick your ears and heal you. Even in Egypt, it was considered a sign of health because it was the sign of spring. When the warmth would come, up would first come the snakes out of the mud, and that was the, the, the symbol of spring's rejuvenation. Um, so it has a healing property. But also think in the Old Testament, the Hebrew snake, right, the seraph that's raised up to cure all of the Jews, the Hebrews, as they wandered the desert uh, when they were stung by the serpents as punishment. They had to look upon the seraph. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a kind of genius of our Lord. Um, artful control of snakes, which do have fangs, dealing with venom and anti-venom, the complex world with all its goodness and all of its sin, for the sake of the good, for the sake of healing and protection, Christ's metaphor is a perfect intermingling of the tradition of both the Jews and the Greeks, sacred and secular, serpents and doves, divine and human, Roman and Catholic. Since the letters of St. Paul and from the time of the earliest church fathers, 
The arts of liberty have been recommended consistently to all schools by the church. For as one pope wrote, the church encourages and fosters all that really assists in the enrichment of the mind. She is, after all, the patron and support of humane studies and liberal arts. Humane studies, or studia humanitatis, and the liberal arts, the arts of liberty, or artes liberales, were first systematically developed by the Romans and still possess a palpable Romanity. Yes, that's a word. <laughs> Don't take my word for it. Here's yet another pope talking about all the other popes. To this, furthermore, bear witness our fostering city, the home of the popes, which under their rule reaped this special benefit, that it became the refuge of the liberal arts and the very abode of wisdom, winning for itself the admiration and respect of the whole world. But Romanity has a double meaning. Let us not be simple as doves. It doesn't just mean Roman Catholic. The liberal arts take their foundations from ancient Greek philosophy, history, poetry, and rhetoric. But the birth of the term and concept of the liberal arts dates from centuries after Athens' golden age, when the great Roman humanist and orator Cicero, who was murdered for his powerful and persuasive opposition to the tyranny of the Caesars, first referred to them as the artes liberales. They consisted of education, literature, and eloquence, and later humanists would tease out a fourth category implicit in his teachings, namely law, which Thomas More referred to as the traditions of men and the dictates of practical reason. Under the Roman Empire, the great philosopher, statesman, and poet Seneca further developed Cicero's ideas of the arts of liberty and humanitas. And by the way, I'm focusing primarily on the arts of liberty, which sort of bleed into humanitas. Uh, a good one that's a capillary between the two would be music which is both considered an art of liberty, but also into humanitas. And the Heights does both, but it's sort of like a core of liberal arts that then radiates out to humanitas, which goes sort of beyond the classroom and into a lot of other things as well. This is just a talk in the liberal arts. I think if you wanted to get the full picture, maybe next year we do one on humanitas too, but um, uh, it's just worth noting. I'm not covering everything. Um, under the Roman Empire, the great philosopher, statesman, and poet Seneca uh, said, um, or brought forth the liberal arts into the fall of the empire, and then Boethius took it up thereafter, uh, and it got routinized into the quadrivium and the trivium uh, in the 500s. Uh, the arts of liberty are decidedly Mediterranean and specifically Roman in concept and design, developed and expanded by the Latin West after the Christianization of the Roman Empire and the conversion of the barbarians in Northern Europe. So that's some of the tedious background. Um, from the beginning, the church fathers were greatly concerned with incorporating the liberal arts or arts of liberty into education. Two of the most famous apologies for the arts of liberty uh, come from the church uh, fathers, one Greek and one Roman. Basil the Great's famous letter, two young men on how they might derive profit from pagan literature, uh, is a complex and ironic letter that requires one to have a training in the liberal arts in order to fully understand the letter's meaning, in part by employing many of the subtleties and illusions of pagan literature. It's actually a very difficult text, and you can read it ten times and grow in uh, your understanding of it. The letter is a kind of mental workout uh, in the liberal arts or the arts of liberty, and eventually it bears much fruit. And if you've ever read it, I just told you a stupid pun about that. That doesn't matter. On the other hand, <clears throat> In Latin, Augustine of Hippo offers a thorough and straightforward defense of Christianity's adoption and adaptation of the liberal arts in his short but extremely influential De Doctrina Christiana. That is very dry, Latin, basic, at you, exhaustive argumentation. I would suggest it might be required reading for any serious teacher of the liberal arts to take the, the uh, time to suffer through that one summer. Uh, it's a phenomenal, eye-opening book, but it is dry and just sort of, I assume you're all very zealous, so let's just do this thing. <laughs> it's like, okay, here we go. <laughs> um, in our own modern era, we have seen a systematic attack on the arts of liberty to the extent that what used to be considered standard linguistic knowledge, Latin, uh, and when possible, Greek, and standard texts for a liberal arts education are no longer taught in many or any Catholic schools at all. The great orator philosopher of Rome, Cicero, wrote a work known as the Deo Ficis, or On Duties, 
which both Thomas More and Thomas Aquinas memorized, as did almost every seminarian who was allowed to go and take theology uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, they both had it memorized, uh, and Aquinas, that's no big deal because he memorized everything, so that doesn't quite count. But it was very, uh, very influential book. It was the most uh, copied book throughout the Middle Ages and the most published book up through the 1700s. Um, the only thing that was copied more in the scriptoriums in the Middle Ages was the Song of Songs, not the Gospels. <laughs> so <it> was, <laughs> presumably because they took better care of the Gospels, they didn't need as many copies, but nevertheless, uh, it's a, it's a um, very influential and important book. From that work, the Catholic Church has adopted the now famous framework of the four cardinal virtues, as well as the concept and the apparatus by which we argue and understand the natural law. The work also contains the single most powerful argument against utilitarianism, perhaps the vice of our age, that I've ever heard of. Uh, nothing I've read elsewhere has beaten it. These are not small contributions from the realm of natural reason, but they are now ignored in most of Catholic education where once they were just shy of adored. That's why he was called Tully in the Summa. He was the best friend of everyone, uh, first name basis. But so far, we've only raised the question, what are the arts of liberty, and what do they do? Why are they so important? Most people you've heard of them, uh, or who've heard of them at all, recognize some vague notion of knowledge we're studying for a complete and happy life. Well, that'd be great if that's what people answered normally. But, but that is often where consensus ends, something good, something important, something to, that we should do. Centuries of corrosion, confusion, and at times inessential addition have rendered for us a concept of the liberal arts that is somewhat relativistic and unspecific. Amongst Christians, there might uh, be recourse to St. Paul's famous admonition. Uh, the liberal arts, I've heard people say this, is you know, sort of what Paul says here. For the rest, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever modest, whatsoever just, whatsoever holy, whatsoever lovely, whatsoever of good fame, if there be any virtue, if any praise of discipline, think on these things. That's very good advice. It's just not uh, advice for schools. It's advice for the brethren. Right? What do schools do? We can't teach everything. What in the vast pool of human knowledge? Like, for instance, it'd be interesting if someone was going to go into the Department of Transportation to understand how the highway system was built in the United States and be able to name all the uh, major corridors and what they, how they were developed. Is that something we teach everyone? Of course not. Right? That's probably not relevant. What, but by what uh, basis do we make those decisions? in every field. Uh, the liberal arts can help us here. They really can. Uh, Christendom's long tradition of education uh, all recommend, the church as well, Western civilization in general, uh, recommend that schools once again take up the discipline and special focus of the liberal arts or the arts of liberty. And translating the artes liberales as the arts of liberty should, I hope, shake us out of any easy or too simple shortcut like grammar, logic, rhetoric, the famous trivium of the liberal arts, very important, but, uh, or like arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy, the quadrivium, right? The one concerns the soul and the mind, the other concerns the soul and the mind's relationship to matter. Um, while important, rattling off these formulae for the liberal arts does not answer the question raised by St. Paul's long list of wonderful things worth knowing because it doesn't answer the prior fundamental question that follows from calling the liberal arts the arts of liberty, or at least I hope it does, which is this. What arts, what knowledge and training are needed for a student to become truly free, truly at liberty? Striving to answer that question brings a liberal arts curriculum into much sharper focus, even as it opens up a long process of study and discovery of the wisest counsels for arriving at such a lofty end. Answering this question provides a kind of standard for inclusion of the many good things one might study in the myriad subjects potentially on offer. Making curricular decisions in the classroom with regard to your subjects and on a school-wide level, and this can include everything from how you handle recess and gym, uh, school bells, a host of things. Uh, all of these things, um, right, may further benefit from a mention of a, another kind of doubleness with respect to the liberal arts, like that double serpent image of the caduceus. Uh, in walking about, uh, or in talking about the liberal arts, 
or the arts of liberty, the doubleness that mirrors man's own nature as a composite being, both body and soul. And here I'm following a long tradition from the popes to Thomas More, to Aquinas, to Augustine, uh, all the way back to Cicero and Seneca, the Roman philosopher, statesman, and tragedian or poet uh, who served Nero uh, and kept him good for seven years before he turned into a bizarre and fanatical tyrant. Um, this tradition of a doubled sense of the arts of liberty and the liberal arts blended together like the body and the soul of man and going all the way back to the Romans. This tradition refers to the basics, the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, as the liberal arts, but it understands that these basics of reading, writing, singing, counting, thinking, learning about the natural world, and speaking clearly and truly, these liberal arts are not the whole story of the artes liberales. They also recognize what Cicero called the great quo modo, the way in which, how you do it, what do you do, or what are, what are you heading towards as you do it? The way in which you teach these basic skills in the lower grades, and as they grow older, more and more the actual content of these courses, take on the, that second sense of the arts of liberty, namely philosophy or the sapiential quest. Seneca, in one of his famous epistles, recognized this double meaning of the arts of liberty. He wrote, the arts which belong to the education of boys, and today we can certainly and happily add girls, and are somewhat similar to the arts of liberty are those which we Romans call liberal. However, those arts alone are really liberal, or rather, to give them a truer name, really free, whose concern is virtue. Yes, there is grammar, logic, and rhetoric in the mundane sense of reading, thinking, and public speaking. Yes, there would be training in law, the most neglected of all the liberal arts, by the way, except in our law schools, although that's debatable. <laughs> yes, there is arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy in some recognizable and basic form, but these all must be oriented toward the full fashioning of character under the double orientation of poetry and philosophy, under that double orientation of the Western tradition. These two secular serpents can be brought to serve that little, simple dove, like two tricky, difficult, noble, even proud handmaids that require real art to bring into the service of the good, the true, and the beautiful, which ultimately find their perfection in God, who is perfect and simple. By way of example, let's look at grammar with this double vision of both basic instruction and that quo modo, a philosophical way in which to consider grammar. The study of grammar did not and does not mean simply the study of subjects and predicates and outlining sentences. It includes that, of course, but it is much more. Grammar means the teaching of vernacular grammar, Latin grammar, and, when able, Greek grammar, as we understand the term today, in order to teach and to understand the use of language on the higher order of poetry, both lyric and epic, and public oratory, law, and thought. The grammarian of Rome was a master linguist and arch literary critic from the Greek word for judge. The teacher of English, Latin, or Greek grammar would teach the language, but also select and teach those great works in such a way, in the quo modo, most beneficial to the education in liberty. Those works that best communicate the moral philosophy required for a free life. The works that most prepare the student for prudence. Some combination of a classics teacher, a moral philosopher, and a vernacular literature teacher would be the equivalent of a teacher of grammar in the sense of the word as listed in the original charter of the trivium. Similar expansions, underway here at the Heights, by the way, thank goodness, of logic, music, geometry, rhetoric, and law, all the liberal arts, need deeper development as the arts of liberty in order to realize fully a truly profound renaissance in the arts of liberty. And by the way, it's happening, so get on board. Uh, it's, it's really happening. Um, and we need it, we need it desperately, and I don't have to tell you if you have cable news. Uh, as Seneca implied, the arts of liberty are both a kind of attitude toward virtue and a set of golden books and doctrines concerning liberty, self-rule, human nature, the nature of the city, the dangers of tyranny, the art of friendship, 
While it is true that the liberal arts make room for the literature and history of a given native tongue, provided that the languages poets and historians understand, adopt, and incorporate the liberal arts, that is, provided those authors are truly wise, and while it is true that other texts can be read by teachers who, as Basil the Great says, like the bee will gather from the pollen the choicest honeys. It is, however, not true that the ancient authors are just as good as any other set of vernacular authors for teaching these arts of liberty. The ancient authors, studied ideally in their original Latin and Greek, are, in fact, better and deserve pride of place. And of our vernacular authors, those most steeped in the ancient tradition deserve the second pride of place. Hence, the long preference in the arts of liberty for Shakespeare, who was deep in the councils of Plato, Plutarch, Tacitus, Cicero, Seneca, Aristotle, and many others. Uh, Got to give a shout out for my bard. Uh, the arts of liberty cannot be reduced to an intention to expose students to a general history or to some vague notion of good books or the fine arts or high culture or just good music or, worst of all, art for art's sake which has ever been the slogan of those opposed to the liberal arts. No, the liberal arts are a certain canon of works which teach a certain attitude, or if you like, a certain attitude which demand a certain canon of works from a more or less definite canon of authors in history, poetry, oratory, and law. law with lots of room for innovation on, you know, there's, it's like 80%, there's lots of things you should try and cover. But even amongst that, there's an enormous uh, reservoir that you couldn't exhaust. Uh, and you'd be able to try new things every year. Um, where was I here? No, the liberal arts are this canon. Right? And from this canon flows, as one pope put it, doctrine that is deep and solid, especially in sound philosophy. Here the pope does not mean Catholic doctrines of theology. He means secular doctrines of natural reason, doctrines of, for the most part, ancient philosophy. Uh, and Pope Benedict talks about this, right, in his uh, Regensburg address concerning uh, uh, de-Hellenization uh, and how we have to get back to these um, bedrock doctrines. And if that were not clear, the Pope goes on to quote Seneca's warning against fads in the same sentence. In that passage, Seneca worries about liberal arts enthusiasts without a rooted understanding in both the practical liberal arts and the proper philosophic argumentation or orientation of the liberal arts or arts of liberty toward virtue, toward prudence, and sound doctrines of natural philosophy. Here, uh, he fears they will turn the students of faddish or needlessly antiquarian versions of liberal arts into young men and women who are, quote, troublesome, wordy, tactless, self-satisfied bores who fail to learn, <laughs> who fail to learn what is needed precisely because, and the Pope quotes, they learned instead what was superfluous. They teach the difference between a ponderously ill-formed and onerous turn of phrase and the words that might move a friend from vice. That's what the liberal arts can do. What else can they do? They can teach that undisciplined passions can be mistaken for the will of the gods. They teach the flatterers are difficult to detect and they give strategies for spotting and avoiding them. They teach their students how to benefit from what they read and how to read only that which benefit them. The liberal arts bequeath moral types and stock characters of extreme importance to what has been called the moral imagination, which was uh, Headmaster De Vicente's talk last month. The philosopher, the poet, the tyrant, the powerful sophist, the noble orator, the honor-loving soldier, dangerous in his lack of self-knowledge, the venal and cowardly merchant, the heartless bureaucrat, the peevish lawyer ungraced by poetry and rhetoric which would help him to hear profitable truth spoken in a diction unsuited to his own preferred legal jargon. And then the most dangerous type of all, the teacher of the arts of liberty who easily falls into pedantry. Uh, moving on, the arts of liberty <laughs> teach the path of citizenship and statesmanship and the means to rise in the world without recourse to vanity, pride, and self-will. They teach that any true philosophy must first teach its students to be humane and sociable with all the rest of mankind, and that it is a false philosophy that teaches otherwise. And the liberal arts will begin to teach that a good death is worth a life's pursuit. All of these great gifts could, it must be said, mislead us into thinking that the arts of liberty, 
the study of humanity will make their students virtuous. Rigorous study of English, Greek, and Latin poets, historians, and orators is better said to prepare the soul for the acceptance of virtue. It's very important parents who think dropping your kid off at a liberal arts school will make them virtuous. It won't. Uh, in saying so, I've just paraphrased a pope, St. Thomas More, as well as the last flower of pagan philosophy, Seneca, whom both More, More and the venerable pope were deliberately and knowingly echoing. The arts of liberty do not make their student virtuous, but they are, except in certain cases among the incapable, a necessary condition for the attainment of virtue in, Seneca says, much the same way food does not make you virtuous, and yet you can't achieve virtue without any food. And you must eat. Uh, that claim, by the way, is the most striking claim of the liberal arts tradition, is it's as necessary as food. So let me put it in a little more familiar terms for this crowd. San Jose Maria says, there is no excuse for those who could be scholars and are not. And the very next point in his way, after this one, as arranged by St. Jose, uh, Jose Maria himself, quotes the old Roman proverb made famous by the ancient Pliny the Younger and by the rhetorician Quintilian, non multa sed multum, not many things but well. Perhaps there is another not so subtle hint like that of the Pope and indeed the entire tradition of Christian education enjoining us not to stray too far in our studies from the arts of liberty and the sound doctrines of the ancients. The ancient Seneca wrote, hence you see why liberal studies are so called. It is because they are studies worthy of a free man. But there is only one really liberal study, that which gives man his liberty. In the study, it is the study of wisdom and that is lofty brave, and great-souled. In one sense, that sounds proud and lofty. I think it is, nonetheless, true. But I also see Augustine and St. Thomas More's at once humbler and far more ambitious argument for the purposes of the liberal arts and the arts of liberty. More said it fostered that one special thing without which all learning is half lame, namely a good mother wit, without which all learning is half lame? It's a bold statement. That good mother wit is a phrase, not surprisingly, which more cribs from Geoffrey Chaucer, the famous English poet and, surprise, classicist. That seems a humbler goal. Or is it? Augustine and More both also saw the arts of liberty as the primary means by which one might fruitfully, artfully, and wittily read Holy Scripture. In fact, more in his letter to Oxford where he's defending Greek study to an anti-Greek movement at Oxford at the time. They called themselves the Trojans. Uh, <laughs> lays a heap of rhetoric in defense of, of study of Greek, but then leaves it at, how could you ever deny it? Because it's the path to reading scripture. But all the liberal arts were in the service of this. Reading rightly the very word of God Sounds even loftier than anything Seneca ever dreamed of, doesn't it? And St. Augustine went further, and I think more would have agreed, holding that the arts of liberty help one learn to read scripture, the world, and God's action in the world. One might say the Confessions is an entire book about reading providence before your eyes rightly. Only an understanding of our littleness and helplessness before God only firm conviction of our need for a savior, only the Holy Spirit, that perfect dove of heaven, could keep such hopes for the liberal arts from becoming a pair of truly deadly serpents. Perhaps the arts of liberty as a way of playing what small role we can in the formation of our own virtuous education and the virtuous education of others, perhaps these arts of liberty are our ordinary little way to Jesus. They are old but new, they are borrowed, they are true. And rather than become complicated and proud, insisting upon miracles and special favors, like that cheesy plastic St. Joseph in that apocryphal gospel, perhaps the formula is simple, hard work in the same fields of study that many of those who've come before us have tilled. Perhaps in pursuing the arts of liberty, an education for a life of service, an education for the prudent double vision, the one eye toward life in this world, and the other eye fixed firmly on the next. 
Perhaps it would be complicated pride to wish to be in St. Isidore the farmer's field when we've been given our own, here and now. Perhaps we might be more like simple, good St. Isidore if we let the inspired words of Sirach from the wisdom books of the Old Testament move us a little here tonight. My son, from your youth up choose instruction, and until you are old, you will keep finding wisdom. Come to her like one who plows and sows, and wait for her good harvest. Thank you. And now Tom Longano. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. So I was sitting there kind of looking around the audience. And I was just thinking, you guys are such a good audience. Like you're just like so focused and still and quiet. And I realized, well, it's because what I'm used to as third graders. <laughs> right. So there's a lot of like, you know, fidgeting and poking and this, you know, whatever, squealing. So if I get through like two senses and then like pause to make sure there's, you know why. And I'm not used to one of these either, so I might kind of taste it. This is, this is an upper school thing. <laughs> the we don't have these things in the lower school, unfortunately. I'm not sure if I would use it. Anyway. Um, so a couple days ago, I was preparing for this talk, or kind of re-preparing for this talk. Um, and I took out my envelope uh, from the summer and looked at the three things. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was thinking, I wanted to make this talk a little bit different from the one I gave over the summer. Because the one I gave over the summer, the purpose of it was to, and it was sort of, I gave reasons, and it was a top-down approach with the idea of putting the figure of the teacher back into discussions on uh, the liberal arts and on liberal education. So discussions about the curriculum are great, of course, but it's also good to talk about who's teaching these subjects. And I wanted to take the same kind of thrust tonight, but from a different perspective, which is the perspective of an individual teacher, a third grade teacher. So the anecdotes that I talk about are going to be from mostly the little guys. But I was also thinking that I have a lot of experience not in teaching the older grades, but in attending the older grades. So being on the other side of the, uh, the teacher's equation. It, yeah. <laughs> he was on one of the sides of the equation for a couple of my years. Very, very good equation. Anyway. <laughs> that was not a planned anecdote, as you can probably tell. Uh, so, and as Rich noted, I've only been teaching for one year. So, I mean, this is one year and a couple months now. So the idea is like, okay, great. He's going to tell us about the art of teaching. I mean, some people in here that I know have been teaching for decades. There are many parents in here who have been parenting for decades. And parents are the primary educators. So they are the sort of like super teachers. They are the main teacher. So everything that I say about the teacher as an artist, I think, applies in a very direct sense, maybe even more importantly to parents. But I'm going to try and say some of my experience in the art of teaching um, and hopefully give just some things to think about and then maybe hear from you guys. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the question and answer in the end. Uh, to hear from your experience, because ultimately, this art uh, of teaching, it really benefits from dialogue, dialogue about our art, um, and I'll get into that a little bit in the talk. So, the teacher is an artist, and not just any artist, he's the liberal artist, or she, he's the liberal artist. And the goal of the liberal artist is the liberation of the students, as Matt has pointed out in his talk. The power of the liberal arts is to allow our students to live good, free lives. And the books themselves won't motivate them to do this. The books are great. You know, amazing texts of enormous learning. You should definitely read the books. But I can imagine someone sitting in, you know, 
a nice hardwood library in, in the corner, paging through Aristotle for most of his life. And I can imagine them not living a very free life. You can, we, can, we, can get, we can delve into the books, but we need the teacher to bring these truths to life for us. Because if these truths are going to be liberating, if they're going to be transformative, we need to see them lived out, acted out, dramatized. So the teacher is sort of the bridge that connects the student to the text. And that's why the teacher is so crucial to a good liberal arts education. Teachers show us how to live the truths we learn in these studies. And they show us by their example. So children from a very early age, I know a lot about the early ages, but actually us too, we learn by example. Like we still continue to learn by example. And so the primary function in my eyes of the liberal artist is to teach through examples. And in the home, the model for pretty much everything is the parents. At school, the model for pretty much everything is the teacher. And this is very important. The teacher is always on a sort of stage. We might think of the liberal artist as a dramatic artist, as a sort of someone who's acting out a character, not putting on a character, but acting out in a, in a more genuine way. It's a genuine expression of the teacher's character. And the teacher dramatizes the subjects and brings them to life. So what does it mean to sort of bring a subject to life? How can we bring the liberal arts to the students? Well, I think it can be anything as simple as just citing contemporary examples, like if we're reading Aristotle. I don't know why I keep going back to Aristotle. I studied philosophy in college, so that might be part of it. But if we're reading Aristotle, maybe the teacher asks the student, what do you think Aristotle has to say on the 2016 presidential election? <laughs> Something like that. I don't know if you'd have a lot to say. Facebook. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> but those type of questions. Are we in agreement? <laughs> <laughs> those type of questions immediately, I think, take the student out from the idea that this is just school. This is something that's different from my everyday life. And it connects the two worlds. Because if the liberal arts are to be transformative, if the liberal arts are to be lived, then there needs to be those connections and that bridge between what the student's talking about at home, what the student's talking about with their friends, what they think about, what they care about, and what they're learning. And the teacher is the one to do that. Now, my anecdotes don't relate to politics or whatever in the lower school. Normally, my anecdotes would be like, well, if mommy says this to you, and then they all immediately know, you know, or like, or I'll talk about like the stick wars and this sort of a thing. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the bravery of Achilles, because I teach them ancient history. And then I'll relate that to, you know, running after another boy with a stick in the valley, because they have these big stick wars, right? Actually, they're not supposed to use the sticks to hit the other boys, but that's been a point of contention. They, just, they, have, to, they have to learn this, but <laughs> use their freedom well. Uh, but yeah, so showing them that the rage that Achilles feels, which we talk about, and we recognize, like, okay, that rage was bad. He should have controlled himself a little bit more. And even third graders know he should have controlled himself a little bit more. And you can say that's the same rage that we feel when Timmy breaks our fort that we worked hard on. You know, so we have to control that more too. It's, and, then, and then these texts, you know, Achilles sort of comes alive a little bit to them. And that's very important, I think, especially from such an early age, if we want them to be inspired to learn these great texts and to put in the time and the hard work and effort that Matt was talking about to learn the great texts, to lead good lives. So that's one of the ways that we bring it to life for them. Another way of dramatizing the liberal arts is showing them the ex an example of a person who they respect who takes these studies seriously as formative. So showing them the example of someone who's living the liberal arts him or herself. And that's what the teacher can do. And for example, I talk about reading all the time to my students. That's one of my like big pushes. There's some parents of my students here, so they know. Like, big push, get them to read, OK. But I don't tell them to read or try and force them to read. 
sometimes I'll ask them, like, hey, what are you reading? But not, not in a way like, you should be reading this, or you should definitely read that book. I talk about reading, I talk their ears off about reading about what I'm reading. Oh, I love this book. Oh, this book is great. Oh, you know what I was reading the other day? I was reading The Voyages of Dr. Doolittle. Oh, my gosh. There's, there's a talking, you know, there's talking chimpanzee and like, all, I don't know, just going on and on. And I've probably read more children's literature now in the past year. I've been like over a decade and a half. But I love it. Actually, these stories are really good. And I would encourage you, especially if you have small children, to read the stories and to be able to share them, share these share your love of the stories with your boys, your children. And I think it's part of the teacher's role to show the students that, yes, I love these books, and you can too. Like, the, the sort of a, you know, they're looking at you, and they're looking at the parent, they're looking at the teacher, and they're wondering, what's he doing? What's she doing? If you're reading these books, they'll pick them up too. And, yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've had to correct the boys in our silent reading study hall. <laughs> because third graders don't have the greatest attention span, right? This isn't a secret. But they have the opportunity to either go to mass or to read during the mass time at the Heights every day, silent reading. And last year, it was a struggle. It was an ongoing struggle. And then I had kind of like a new strategy that I just tried out, and I was amazed that it worked. I was like, oh. Like, almost like magic, in two minutes, they all were reading. And normally it was like, hey, put that away. No, you can't go to the bathroom. Why are you standing up again? Like this sort of, you know, like going up to the, and then this sort of, like, why is the book on your head? Like, you know, we're trying to read here. But this is it. They were all reading in like one minute. And here's what I did. I just sat in front of the room and took out a book and started reading. That was it. Because if I'm up there playing a game, like, oh, I'm going to play the whack-a-mole with, like, who can distract me and so on, they'll see Ms. Langan's playing the game, and then that's, like, you know, that's more interesting than reading anyway. But if I'm reading, then they'll follow that example. And it, it's actually amazing. I was so amazed that it works. And then sometimes they have to go to the bathroom, and they almost feel bad about disturbing me. Ms. Langan, can I go to the bathroom? Yes, sir. And then they like, can go back to their book, you know. It's the best study halls ever. <laughs> It's great, and then I actually get to read, anyway. <laughs> so that's another example of how they follow the teacher's example, or the parent's example. I think if parents read more in the home, you know, if you were to just sit on your couch and Johnny walks in one door, sees mom reading, walks out the other door, that could be huge for Johnny's love of reading going on. Even more, you could talk about the books you're reading at dinner time. And they don't even have to be books that the boys or, you know, your children read. Just books that you find interesting. Now, we don't force our students to read. We can't force them to learn. So the, the liberal artist, as a sort of, you know, it's almost like a sculptor. A sculptor doesn't force beauty out of the block of marble. The sculptor guides and chips away and allows the marble to shine in its own right, to help mold it with the artist's idea of the good. And teaching is a living art. The matter that's being shaped is alive. As teachers, our goal is not the individual lesson of the day or high scores on some standardized test. The, the goal, and I think it's important to keep saying this, the goal is the liberation of the students. Helping to shape their intellects and inspire their wills to want this freedom, even from a very young age, to want this freedom to desire the good, and most importantly, I think, to act towards it. So we have to show them the liberal arts in action. This art must be personal. Our teaching can be general, especially if we have big classes. But also, even in these big classes, we must attend to each student and their individual needs. And sometimes this can be hard. But the teacher and the parent the artist, is concerned with shaping the students' wills, so we must give them the freedom to act, to experience these subjects on their own, to let them decide to learn, not force them to learn. We can't force anyone to be free. That's a contradiction in terms. I can't force you to live a free life. The desire needs to spring from the person. And my interactions with the boys at recess which we have a lot of in the lower school, as you're probably aware. The times when they feel the most free 
at home in themselves and, you know, that they are acting completely on their own volition. These conversations are by far the most formative. That's really where we bond, we, we form the bonds of trust that are so crucial to the teacher's art being effective. There are times when maybe I'm having a difficult time with a student in class if he's acting up or being a little bit um, unruly. And I'll find him at recess. I'll say, oh, I need to have a conversation with him at recess. So I'll go out to recess when he's playing in the valley, you know, with a stick or a football or something. And I don't go to him and say, you've been terrible in class, right? Or <laughs> we need to talk, right? And sometimes they'll see me walking up there and be like, oh, this is going oh my gosh, I'm not too happy with me right now, right? But I'll go up to him and say, hey, you want to throw the football around? Or, oh, what's that for your building? Yeah, explain. Oh, are, who are you fighting? Yeah, oh, they're, they're down the hill. Oh, wow, that's interesting. We've got to reinforce that side. Or this, you know, like those type of conversations, that type of friendship, and it, it works wonders in the classroom because then when they go back into the classroom and they have those memories and, and they, you know, they trust Mr. Longano. So then when they act out or do something that they know Mr. Longano doesn't like, it's all the, it's all the more felt. So these type of interactions, when they're feeling free, when they're feeling in their own skin, that's very important for teaching. And I think some of the most important memories that I have of teachers at the Heights were from hallways or the parking lot. It wasn't from the things that I might have learned in class. But the, the memory of the person is what sticks. And the memory of the person is shaped most of all, I think, through those type of conversations. And it's the same with my professors in college as well. So it's not just the Heights thing. And the best edu educational environments for me, or that, the ones that have been the most effective, are the ones that foster and encourage these personal interactions between teacher and student, both inside and outside the classrooms. These personal conversations, of course, are needed for parents in the home as well. And I think we can get so, you know, our households can get so crazy that we don't even think about it. But sometimes those are the most formative conversations with your children. The liberal artist thrives on these small human encounters. Through his or her art, they become beautiful. And if these studies are to be transformative, they have to be personal. As artists, I think it's important that we continue to reflect on our creative actions, how we present ourselves and through our personas, through the character we're giving to our students and our children, how we present the subjects that we teach as well. The artist's creative art derives from love, love of the subject, a love that stems from the joys of creation. Right? So parents, of course, create new beings. But the creation does not end with the beginning, at conception. I think that we continue to create new beings. Through our art, through this liberation, this transformation, this change, as our children and our students grow, there's a creative process that occurs. And so the teacher becomes the facilitator, the parent becomes the facilitator of that creative process. Sort of like the sculptor with the statue again. Thinking about how we do this, how we continue to create as teachers and parents is crucial to our success. Just thinking about it and talking about it. Artists dialogue and debate about experience, methods that are effective. They discuss difficulties and problems. They share ideas. And as a new apprentice artist at the Heights, these conversations are my training. This exciting exchange of the different creative expressions, the ways that the, really the masters that I'm surrounded by teach their craft, these I can bring into the classroom and when I teach, I can bring my whole person to the classes because I know that I'm not alone in doing so. So I think it's very important that we have a community of artists behind us as we enter into the classroom. A community that's upheld by genuine friendship and good, rational debate. This is needed for artists to thrive. And students feel this. They feel and appreciate the friendship amongst the faculty at a school. <coughs> this community is sustained by good dialogue about art. It's important at a school with teachers, but perhaps more so important at home with parents, dialoguing with other parents, dialoguing husband and wife dialogue, 
think those are very important. And this isn't, <laughs> wow, he thinks this is important. Great, is he married? But <laughs> actually, a great teacher told me this a couple days ago, who is married and has wonderful children and is in this room, so I won't embarrass him. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> taking our art seriously leads to these discussions. And discussions help us to bring ourselves to the classroom. I think this is a big part of our art. At 8.20 in the morning, when the third grade mind is the most hyper, and my mind is still asleep, <laughs> it's very hard to bring myself to the classroom. And sometimes, you, you know, part of our art is making these kind of like practical on the fly decisions. Like, I'm not going to be able to teach this lesson because I simply don't have the energy to do it. Or I'm not going to be able to teach this lesson because they need to go outside. They're just, they're crazy. <laughs> Nothing's going to, and maybe the lesson outside is more important than the one I wanted to teach anyway. That's why it's, I, I really appreciate the freedom that we have here as teachers to be able to experiment with our art. But it's important, I think, that the classes I'm most excited about, they're most excited about. And this is not just for the lower school. I think this goes across all, uh, all grades. I remember my professors or my teachers in high school, the ones that really got animated about it, those were the classes I wanted to go to. Those were classes I even looked forward to. I wasn't, I, I wasn't like a big nerd, like looking forward to classes, right? But I, I and other people would look forward to those classes too. We would talk about it in the hallway. So the classes that the teachers are excited about, that the teacher can bring him or herself to, those are the best and the most effective classes. And in our teacher persona, or our personas as parents, I think we give our students and our children part of us. And the most fruitful art is infused with the artist himself or herself. This is a big point of art criticism. It's like, you know, some people, you know, well, we don't, okay, I'm not going to get into that. Anyway, <laughs> the, the most fruitful art is infused with the artist self. If you want to take me up on that later, you can. <laughs> the artist love. That's what makes the art compelling. That's what makes it beautiful, I think. And I think one of the big struggles for teachers, because we do this every day, and because we do it with students, and it's, you know, the students aren't always the best students, and so on. One of the biggest struggles is actually bringing ourselves to each class, and to make ourselves present and vulnerable for the students. Because this vulnerability and the joy and the optimism through which we show our love. Because if I show, if I communicate to high schoolers, for example, that I'm very passionate about this subject, that's making me very vulnerable to them. But this is what gives our art its true beauty. This is the love that shines forth, is that vulnerability. That's what gives it power. And we need, I think, a good community, community of teachers and artists, parents, to be able to do that, to express ourselves with that vulnerability. And it's not all about us, of course. <laughs> I, th I think it's very important to think about how we take our art to the level of the students. Uh, I laugh with my students a lot, play games with them, so that together we're sort of, I, I don't pander to them and to say, okay, we're all going to hang out and like goof around and we're just going to keep goofing around. But I show them that it's okay to goof around and that I like goofing around so that they can see me as a friend and then together I can elevate the discussion, elevate the topic that we're going to into the subjects that we need to learn. But I think it's very important for a student or for a teacher at any level to be able to go down to, the, to where the students are, to meet the students where they, are, where they are, and bring them up out to where they need to be. And imposing tests or systems of learning in a sort of top-down approach, unfortunately, I think, tends to quell the student's natural curiosity. Because you're saying you have to do this. You're not going to like it. It's okay. No one likes it. So do it. You know, it's, I mean, that's not an environment that we would want to put our kids in. That's not an environment that we want to be in ourselves. And I think it's, it's no surprise that there's a high dropout rate in many colleges nowadays. Because once the enforcement is gone, once there's not that like immediate, you know, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, the pressure to do it. There's just not the will that's there. So rather than enforce these things, I think it's very important to, take a, to go down to their level and say, look, you have this natural curiosity for learning. You want to improve. You want to change. And I feel that too. 
And it's good that you have these desires. So let's work with them. And so that involves treating them almost as equals, which I think is very important, fostering that respect and showing them that we respect their freedom. And I think at all levels, it doesn't help to talk down to students. And I often talk down to my students out of failure because maybe I'm tired, so I get critical or I get kind of snappish or sarcastic. But every time that happens, I try and go and apologize to them afterwards to show them that that's not what I want to do. That's not what I want you to get from this experience of learning. And the reason I do that actually is because there was a great teacher at the Heights in my senior year who had a, I had a discussion with, we had a meeting about one of my college essays and he was, uh, he was a little bit distant during the meeting. I didn't, really, I didn't really notice anything, but the next day he came to me and he drew me aside and he apologized for being distant. He said, I'm sorry, I was not present during that meeting and if you'd like to talk about it again, I'd love to. And that like really struck me because he, he was someone who I really respected coming and apologizing to me. And I was wow. So now I try and bring that to my students. Anyway, I think that treating, treating the students with respect as, as sort of friends or fellow journeyers in our quest to learn is very crucial for getting them interested and motivated to learn the liberal arts and to live freely. And finally, in conclusion, the best way to find common ground with our students or our children, and I think the best way to find new and creative ways to teach the liberal arts is to continue our own learning. And this happens in dialogue with others, but importantly, in reading the liberal arts. We want to bring them to life for our students and to motivate our students to live freely, so we have to live them ourselves. And as Matt said, reading and rereading these texts will change us. It will change us and help us to live freely, to be happy, to spread joy, because we don't live in a vacuum. We don't live in isolation. So through liberating ourselves and through seriously attending to these studies, we'll be able to help others, everyone that lives around us in ways that we can't really even imagine, especially those that most rely on our example, like our children or our students. So I think we read and we learn for them. And that is the heart of what it is to be a liberal artist. Um, gosh, let me count the ways. Um, I mean, one is the sort of, the, the one we experienced in the 20th century, which is the sort of Marxist uh, materialist version where everything is driven down to mere matter uh, and there's no consideration of loftier uh, transcendental uh, matters. And that's, that we, we've seen a lot of that. Um, history taught as a series of power struggles um, we've seen uh, literature taught as uh, nearly the thing itself, uh, like the, what's the word say and no understanding of the analogical or anagogical levels. Um, so there's those sorts of you know, ideological overlays. But, but in a liberal education in one sense, and maybe Tom can ha handle this because it sort of pertains more to his talk, is, is that understanding of crushing out the personal responsibility and interpretation of the student. I mean, you present these things to them and then you have to, you have to uh, uh, provide them the opportunity to deal with it. So, you know, if there's never seminar, that's sort of a, maybe not necessarily, I mean, you're a St. John's guy. I mean, that's a, I, you know, the sort of the balance of some lecture, some seminar, right? It's, 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 it's a, uh, that's, that's a key thing is getting them to think and articulate for themselves. But that's also part of, if you include rhetoric, well, goodness gracious, that means they have to fill their heads with every kind of knowledge that they can and then bring them together synergistically and articulate in oratory something for themselves. So things, in one sense, if you attend to the liberal arts and their basic praxis, you're going to do better. But another example, and this we could talk about maybe a whole other night, but many of the aspects of Common Core um, have uh, resulted in a kind of uh, 
teacher centrism that's the wrong kind, where they become dependent for special secret knowledge from the teacher, as opposed to primarily concerned with teaching them to read reality. So the whole point is sort of like you're trying to get them to beat their wings and you, they don't need you anymore. And by the time they're a senior, ideally you could say like, read this, and then suddenly you see the wash of their intelligence coming back at you. It's a real reward. Um, as opposed to holding things back, uh, the signal and the noise kind of thing. It's like I have the secret decoder ring that lets you find the right signal and all the static. Uh, that, that sort of thing is, is becoming more and more pervasive uh, and, and dangerous. And I'm speaking in general terms, but I don't know if that helps. I don't know. Yeah, I think that was pretty, okay. that was good. <laughs> pretty comprehensive. Great question. <laughs> it's your turn, Tom. <laughs> wow. I think there was, uh, I'm not, I, maybe I'll say a little thing and then Matt can kind of go on with um, something more comprehensive. But I, there was a good quote that was kind of going around social media from C.S. Lewis about uh, how, and this was from the screw tape letters. So the devil's talking to, or Wormwood's talking to the tempter, and he's saying, you're doing great because you're keeping them all, you know, all hopped up on these political disputes, and he's despairing about the evil in the world, and that's awesome. And he's talking to his friends about how terrible the world is because he's not attending to what he should be attending to, which is to things that he can actually change, things that he can actually do well. And, and so there's this... There's, I think a, it's a big temptation is to talk about these grand general schemes and then lose sight of where we are. And what the liberal arts can do is put our feet firmly on the ground and show us with very, you know, the, very encouraging language, I think, like some of the letters of Seneca. Um, I read the letter, letters of Seneca a lot after uh, at Matt's insistence. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was very insistent. <laughs> and and these type of these type of letters can be can be liberating, like a sort of you know you kind of feel like you're a boat stranded at sea, uh, in in these you know big world crisis type events that the media is presenting for us, and and yet there's just a sort of no like live your life, be simple, try to be virtuous. You'll fail, but keep trying, and things will work out for you. So there's a sort of trust, and there's a, there's a, it's a very, um, it's like a fresh wind for that boat that's stranded, leads you into somewhere that you know, like a safe harbor. I, I know these guys. Like, reading the liberal arts, they'll become your friends. They'll become your companions on the way. And that sort of friendship, I think, is very liberating, such that we won't be completely moved or disturbed by these type of, cataclysmic events that are happening around us. Matt. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I would, that I would add uh, might be one thing that, was, that I kind of hinted at in the talk, and it's a much wider discussion in one sense, is the moral philosophy that is embedded in arts and letters, essays, poems, uh, paintings, songs, uh, plays, novels. There's a whole branch of moral philosophy which has not been taught very effectively for a long time, and it's mostly the branch of moral philosophy that has to do with prudence. Uh, and prudence is the, the statesman's art. It's, it's political art. It's, it's the political virtue. Um, and in one sense, the liberal arts, I think, over time, if focused and refined, will provide a much sharper um, and more prudent citizenry that won't find itself backed into corners like this. Uh, now that's cold comfort in the moment. But another thing that literature and the arts and letters, if uh, the, the tradition is really laid out over time for, for uh, the students, and, and at the Heights we're doing a good job and we're you know, making changes every year to do it uh, in, in an even better way, is understanding how language isn't just sort of a study of communication for other people, it's also a study for how you communicate with yourself. What are the words you tell yourself? What is the rhetoric that you apply to your own worries, fears, and concerns? Hamlet is a perfect tragedy uh, for this problem, and it's taught to the seniors. Uh, because Hamlet doesn't know how to talk to himself. 
He talks to himself a lot, but God help him. It's the worst kind of talking to yourself possible. And, it, and it's about political problems and social problems and sexual problems and a thousand problems. And it drives him crazy and he loses his mind. So in one sense, being liberal arts can teach you how to be a custodian of your thoughts in such a way that you can do what Tom was talking about, which is actually refine your monologue and your dialogues into a kind of counsel that will lead to prudence and hope and the right kind of optimism. Um, <laughs> um, so what is freedom? What do, what do you mean when you say freedom? Um, yeah, uh, so uh, you're talking about Joseph Pieper's uh, Leisure, the Basis of Culture, and but also, uh, uh, was it Happiness and Contemplation? Is that another one? There's a lot. Yeah, sort of the idea of like, look, okay, what does it mean to be free, right? And so and that, there's a certain sense that I didn't handle that, sort of like, you know, what does that mean? And yes, uh, part of it means that you are trying to get to uh, a kind of, um, trying to get to uh, the beatific vision <laughs> uh, and, and get to God and, you know, but also, I think what you might be referring to is that man's an end in himself. Yeah. Um, right. And so there's these, there's these high moments of, of leisure and culture. I agree with that. I, I'm, in one sense, that's one of the things I worry about and why I frame it the way I do is because sometimes that gets misunderstood in, with regard to uh, leisure for its own sake. It's all for man's sake, right? Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying you're, but I'm just saying I, I tend to sort of push on the liberty and keeping it rooted in like the ability to master your passions, but knowing full well that you can't actually do that without grace, um, that man's an end in himself in one sense, but he's, he's, all of these liberal arts are for him completing his end, which is glorifying God. Right and you know, no love and serve him and live with him and see the beauty of division, his, this life and the next. So, it's you know, Aristotle says right, there's a there, you can have an end, but it might not be the final end. So, um, yeah, I think a lot about that. Um, I think with regard to the liberal arts, in one sense, it's more prior to that concern. You're trying to clear the way to get to that kind of peace uh, of soul. Uh, and unity of life to where you can enjoy those higher order goods. Um, but that's a lot of, I feel like I just juggled a bunch of flaming. It's, it's, it's a statement uh, usually careerist sort of education. Mm. Education that is always sort of focused, you know, beginning of right. third grade on career. The fear is, the, but the language, the language of the liberal arts has been, I think, warped in a certain sense by overcorrection against 20th and 19th century Marxism. Right, where everyone's so worried about it being drawn into a utilitarian, the state. It must serve the state, and all of you are just dough in my giant Stalinist bread, right, that I get to mix up. So everyone's like, no, 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 it's, it's for its own sake. It's for its own sake. It's like, no, it's not. It's for man's sake, and man's sake is also for everyone else's sake and for God's sake. So, you know, in one sense, I, I push back on the, um, it, that we study the liberal arts for their own sake. We study them because they're good, high, noble, true, and virtuous for us. But then we also like all of the uses that come from it and the self-control, like there's all these sorts of things. But, but I don't think you can ever separate uh, doing something for, it, for the sake of the good and doing it for the sake of its benefits. That's a, I mean, that's the great question of book two of The Republic, right, is show us justice without any of its benefits. He's like, let's change the subject for like nine books because that's really hard, you know. Uh, so yeah, but, but I know it's right in that, like Peeper needs to be brought into this conversation, but there just wasn't time. Yeah. So I think that if they see these tests as a sort of, I mean, I, I can speak from personal experience. It would, for me, it was sort of like a necessary evil like okay, I have to get this done, uh, type of thing. And I didn't, I didn't really see them the the big standardized tests as having much of a impact on my education or as an indicator of what I had learned. Uh, and I actually think that this is common 
for most people, even, even at schools that are very geared towards um, learning for those tests, they still don't see the tests as you know, a, an indicator of their educational achievement. Maybe it's their career achievement or this sort of a thing. Or it's, it's a necessary stepping stone, but it's not something that's, um, that's relevant to them as persons. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Uh, one of the, I would say that if we are, the, the, the true student of the liberal arts um, will not shirk away from challenges. And these type of tests that are sort of necessary stepping stones, I think, present one of those challenges that with the appropriate amount of study uh, for the AP tests or the SAT tests uh, or grad school tests, they're able to um, you know, excel at and do very well at as well. Uh, so it's not that we need to teach these tests. We, I think it might be more that we, we teach uh, our students to be good learners and, and excellent thinkers through the liberal arts as a sword to forge forward, you know, to, to, show the, to show other people that, yes, I have been educated, I've been educated very well, but also knowing themselves and their own conversations and with their families and so on, knowing that that is not the indicator of their education. That they can perform well in those tests is important, and it shows that they've come pretty far as well. So like, there, there, is a, there is a notion that, yes, it took a lot of work to study for something like the SAT, but also knowing that I studied for the SAT because it's the SAT, not because I was in love with multiple choice questions. <laughs> you know, those things. I don't know if that speaks kind of to, to, to what you were saying. So I think that the, the, the practical concerns, as it were, of, of the liberal arts education um, that, that's the type of thing I think that, that falls into, sort of falls into place if we're attending to being great liberal learners. Then, yeah. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, just maybe the, the, old, the old saw of if you uh, are trying to hit a target and you aim at the target, you're going you're gonna to hit the ground because gravity will pull the arrow down, right? So you aim a little higher. So if the target's SAT, I think we're doing fine by aiming higher at the liberal arts, generally speaking. <laughs> yeah. can, I, can I say something really quick for before it, yeah. you kind of pounce on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, know, I know you have like so much to say on that, so I just want yeah, to get yeah. my two cents in. But it's a great question. who leads Dante all the way up the mountain of purgatory and through the inferno? Virgil. But where does he stop? <laughs> exactly. No, but and the liberal arts can only take you so far. And I think Matt talked a little bit about that. But... The, the idea is that the, the pagans, um, these great towers of, of learning and wisdom, uh, can show us all of the different stages of, um, of man and, and where we fall, where we, where we rise, and this sort of thing. So they can be great moral teachers as well. Yeah, but they're in hell. <laughs> they are. But Dante... <laughs> okay, I think there's also... So it's we can nice, go back and forth. Nice I also hell. don't completely agree with, the, with your interpretation of Plato about the, um, the idea of you know, Homer as being entirely corruptive on the youth. I think that that's oftentimes taken out of context. Uh, so Plato, I think, had a, had a very high understanding of, of art and, and poetry. And there's a lot of... You know, Plato hated the poets. You know, I, I don't know. Yes. That, that's, okay. It's a whole bunch of <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was like... It's an apparatus. I think we question. started getting into it. <laughs> but one of the... Yeah, so I think he might have been responding to uh, poetry being taken as a sort of civic religion, which is not what we're advocating, of course, in the liberal arts. So maybe one of the worries that you might have is, do the liberal arts become a sort of substitute for religion? Uh, and then Matt can talk to that. <laughs> I'm just, meatball, you know, just putting it up there. That was a hot potato. Yeah. Uh, I will not talk to that. <laughs> no? Uh, really? No. no. <laughs> I can talk to that, too. I don't know. <laughs> no. uh, I thought that that's... I yield my time to the senator to my left. <laughs> uh, no. It's a huge question. In one sense, I think that the glyph that, I, that you guys all got handed out is a good warning. They're serpents. They have venom. They can strangle you and kill you. Right? And... Uh, I cut out of, in fact, there's an article on the website that, that about five paragraphs of this are completely cribbed from, but most of the rest is original. But I wrote a big one about the liberal arts, and in there I try to go through what the church has always taught about. It requires a teacher who understands the pitfalls and can find the sound doctrine and make sure it separates out that doctrine from 
the errant doctrines. Augustine, I think, is, the, is your big mallet for this sort of critique because he apparently crushes all pagan thought as this huge disaster which misled him in so many ways. The only positive thing he says, quite frankly, he gives Cicero, he says, Cicero's the one who pulled my face out of the mud. I went and like looked up, but I couldn't get my shoulders out of the mire. Right, just couldn't do it. But Cicero did get me to at least look up and take a breath and say, I want a noble life. But he had no strength of will to do it. That required the prayers of Monica and the grace of Christ. Right? He trashes the pagans. He trashes the stories about the gods. And yet, the entire chiastic structure of the first 10 books of Augustine's Confessions are completely based upon Virgil's Aeneid. He leaves his, wife, his mother in Carthage weeping, just like Dido. He has his terrible loss of his friend, just like Nisus and Euryalus. He uses the entire raw materials of the, of the pagan literature of Rome, the national poem, Right? He condemns it in a thousand ways uh, outright, but subtly throughout, if you know the book, he's praising it and showing what he learned from it and how he gathered out all of the, the gold right, from the Egyptians, right, which used to be applied, and this is Augustine's in De Doctrina Christiana, he lays out, which I think every teacher should read, he says, look, the Jews, when they left Egypt, were told by God to take the gold Right uh, from the Egyptians, their jewelry and their 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 uh, their um, uh, gold work, and tear it all down and melt it down and and adorn the ark, right, and adorn the temple. Uh, that's what August. That's how Augustine says. He says that's what you need to do. Take the good that's in there, grind it up, reapply it, and use it for good. Augustine is reacting to the <clears throat> pagan world that's in love with Homer, in love with. Uh, Virgil. And Plato and Socrates are reacting to people who literally worship Homer as the prophet, like, like the prophet of, of all, tell me about the gods, Hesiod and Homer. So you have to take a big mallet and bash them down to, to get people to not see them as divinely inspired. But that doesn't mean they don't find a lot of good. In fact, as Plato rips uh, Homer in, the, in book two, three, and four, he then starts quoting him constantly and realizes he's got him completely memorized and actually winds up using all of that in his myth of Earth, the end of the Republic, using Odysseus and Achilles and all these type characters to build a whole argument about preparation for death and the good life. So it's, in one sense, it's, it's, yes, it's always dangerous, but it's the kind of danger that is actually part of the virtue of courage. Like it has to be managed. It's, it's one of those things you have to navigate uh, in order to not let that dove be devoured, to not let the sheep be devoured by wolves. Like, you have to be wise as serpents. Like, you have to do it. Uh, but it's a great question, and it's a, it's a huge debate. It's a huge discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Dan.